Five years ago, the Supreme Court ruled that the key tenets of the Scottish Government's name person scheme were unlawful. We're taking a look back at the long road to victory by hearing from some of those involved in this historic legal win and those blazing the campaign trail. In our first video, I speak to our own in-house solicitor advocate, who probably knows the case better than anyone, Sam Webster. Sam, thanks very much for joining me. Uh, why don't we start by just explaining in a nutshell what this named person scheme was? Okay, well, the named person scheme was a policy of the Scottish Government, which was given full force in legislation in 2014 by way of the uh, Children and Young Persons Scotland Act. And under this policy, every child in Scotland would be assigned a named person, every person under the 18. And the named person, usually a school teacher for children above school age or a health visitor for those under that age, the named person would have responsibilities under the legislation uh, to look out for the, um, the well-being of children. So responsibilities to promote, to support and safeguard children's well-being, to give them advice and information, to help them access various services and also to raise any concerns about the child with other relevant public bodies. And uh, um, what is the problem with that? The problem with that policy um, was the complete absence of parents at the heart of it. Um, I think the only reference to parents in, in the law, um, the legislation, was that the parent could not be the named person for their own child. Um, and so you had a situation where a scheme created all these roles, these functions for the named person, but cut across the responsibility of parents as the primary carer for their child, having primary responsibility for their child. On top of that, the legislation provided some ver for a very low threshold for sharing personal and sensitive data about the child with various public bodies. Um, and the complete absence in the legislation of a definition of well-being. Um, so the legislation said that uh, well-being was to be assessed by reference to certain criteria. That criteria was summarised in the acronym SHINARI. So whether the child is or would be safe, healthy, achieving, nurtured, active, responsible, respected or included. Various one of those um, that criteria are incredibly vague, subjective, open to interpretation. Um, so pretty much the named person could get involved in, in pretty much any part of a child's um, life and experience. It's, it's difficult in some ways to look back because we now have uh, GDPR and, and data sharing is um, very, very strict now in a way that perhaps it wasn't uh, a few years ago. Um, so it's, it's it's tough to comprehend, mm. uh, looking back now, how the government, the Scottish government could do this in the first place. I mean, the data protection laws, even at the time of 2014 Act, were strict then. We had the European Union Data Protection Directive, given effect in 1998 in the Data Protection Act. Um, very clear thresholds for sharing personal data, um, clear conditions for the storage and the processing of personal data. Um, it's true to say the GDPR has certainly enhanced some of that um, and I think people are far more aware now of their responsibilities with, with processing and sharing personal data. Um, I think you know, the, 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 the basic policy behind the name person was, was undoubtedly one to, you know, which aimed to help children who needed it. The problem was it's over breadth, um, that, that every child would be given a named person whether they wanted or needed one. Um, uh, and, um, and, and as a result of that, I think one of our great concerns was that children who really needed care and particular attention wouldn't get it, um, given the sheer bureaucracy of this new system. And what was it about, what, what do you think are the key arguments which made this um, a case which was able to be argued in court? Yeah, I mean, the, the issue that we won on ultimately in the Supreme Court was the question of sharing personal data. Um, and I think, I mean, if you look at the, the 2014 Act, uh, the provisions for sharing personal data were clearly at odds with the then Data Protection Act, the da then Data Protection Directive, and the Human Rights Act. So you had a situation where under the legislation, the named person uh, had an obligation, the word must was used, they must 
share information about the child with relevant officials if it was likely to be relevant to their functions as a named person, so likely to be relevant to the child's well-being. So that obligation must, was at odds with the data protection regime, which doesn't impose an obligation on sharing data, but simply sets out some thresholds that must be met if data is to be shared. Um, so you had one law which could not be read compatibly with another law. So I remember in the early days when we were looking at this, this policy and whether to, to, to challenge it, um, you were trying to grapple with about four separate pieces of legislation. You, know, you would have the Data Protection Act here, you'd have the Data Protection Directive in the other hand, you'd have the Human Rights Act you know, down there, and on your lap you'd be looking at the 2014 Act trying to make some sense of it. Uh, and um, you know, there was no sense. I mean, it didn't work. And as the Supreme Court eventually said, the legislation on data protection created a logical puzzle that ultimately it was impossible to solve. So uh, you were part of the, the legal team that was uh, fighting against this. And uh, when it went to the Supreme Court, uh, what was the feeling among, among the no to name person camp? Uh, were, you, were you confident? So we had been to court twice before going to the Supreme Court. We had been in the court of session in Scotland, the, the outer house, and then appealed to the inner house. So we had been round the track twice already um, and um, uh, you know, we knew what it felt like to lose. But going to the Supreme Court, we, we knew that our arguments were strong. We knew that if the judges followed the, the, the logic of our arguments, you know, we, we could win. Um, one never presumes anything, um, but we knew that certainly when we came out of the hearing that we'd had a, you know, a very good day in court. I think it was a couple of days in court. Um, it couldn't have gone better, but we'd have to wait and see what the outcome was. So I think we were hopeful. And it was a good day in court, of course. Uh, that that 5 nil win. Uh, surprised by that? Was I surprised? Uh, well, you say 5 nil. You had five judges who were unanimous in, in their decision that this legislation was not compatible with, Euro with the European Convention on Human Rights, particularly Article 8, the right to a private and family life. Um, I, I think given, given what I've said before about this logical puzzle, um, no, it was not a surprising result. It was certainly one that I think was inevitable from, from the submissions that we had made. Um, and for the court to say that, um, that, uh, that it's not compatible really, um, uh, you know, um, confirmed what we had long said and, and long, long campaigned for. Um, so the court basically said that, that you know, parents could not actually foresee what, what their rights were in terms of sharing of their children's personal data um, because you had this incompatibility of laws and there were insufficient safeguards in the legislation to prevent um, inappropriate sharing of their children's personal data. So um, it meant effectively the, the court had said that this legislation was not law. It had been passed by an act of the Scottish Parliament um, but effectively, it wasn't law under the constitutional arrangements in Scotland. And the judges made some uh, some strong comments in their judgment, didn't they, um, about uh, what the uh, what the name person scheme was actually trying to achieve in some ways. Um, yes, I mean, the, uh, in some ways, the judgment is quite a technical read. Um, a lot of stuff to do with data protection, um, but there was certainly a warning made in the judgment um, by the judges. Uh, warning of, I think it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic quote, um, different upbringings produce different people. The first thing that a totalitarian regime tries to do is to get at the children, to distance them from the subversive varied influences of their families and indoctrinate them to their view, ruler's view of the world. So I mean the, the court wasn't saying that the government had acted in a totalitarian way but it was simply saying though that is the danger um, and you know, legislators have to be careful with the legislation they pass that, that actually there are proper safeguards in there to protect against arbitrary use and that um, the rights of parents and children and people are actually upheld. So it was a, a strong judgment, a good judgment. There were some caveats in the result though, uh, weren't there? It wasn't as simple as the Supreme Court saying repeal this law, it was a bit more nuanced wasn't it? Yes, I mean it, it, it's not for judges to to reject the underlying policy. 
um, it, the job of the judges is to is to find the the fundamental legal flaws, defects in the in the, in the legislation, which is what they did. Um, what they said was, it's not for us now to find a legislative fix to, to this this legislation. It's for the democratic uh, legislature. It's for the Scottish government to to go back to the drawing board uh, and obviously bring forward amended legislation, um, which. Um, is what the Scottish Government then sought to do over the ensuing um, uh, three or four years, uh, three years I think it was. Um, but finally in 2019 the uh, Cabinet Secretary for Education, um, John Swinney, did announce to the Parliament that they wouldn't be pursuing the policy further um, and that they would repeal the, the legislative framework for the main person from the statute book at the earliest opportunity. So in theory it's, it's gone, but uh, are there any um any instances where maybe it's still being run or something similar, right. a watered down version is? So, so the, the, the legislative framework um, is not, not operating because it can't. Um, um, certainly one hears reports in parts of Scotland that, you know, that, that, that um, the idea of a named person is operating. But of course, that, that's, not, that's a named person not in the sense legislated for in 2014. Um, or not always easy to know when, when, when when it's simply a teacher exercising the, the traditional parental, not parental, the traditional pastoral role of, of, of a teacher and where that crosses, o crosses over into something else. Um, um, but, but in terms of sharing personal data, um, uh, you know, uh, those named persons, call them what you, what you like, um, obviously have to share data at a much higher threshold, um, if at all. So nothing particularly untoward to be worried about? Well, I mean, one may hear of examples where um, uh, perhaps data protection law hasn't been followed as it should have been. But, um, I mean, the important thing is there is not a, uh, there's not a, a, a legislative scheme, scheme in place that would have justified the sort of intrusive interferences which we would have seen had we not succeeded in the name person challenge back in 2016 in the Supreme Court. Well, thank you again for joining me and uh, for keeping the legal jargon to a minimum. Thank you, Sam. Thank you.